Today's guest is Mark Wardell of Wardell International. Okay, I'm really excited to have Mark on today. Thank you for coming on the show. Awesome. I'm so glad to be here. We've been friends for a long time and I'm on, so this is, this is really cool. Awesome. So, I mean, for, for those that don't know, I mean, you're a management uh, guru. I, I, I want to call you because uh, you know a ton about this stuff. Um, How'd you get going on this? Wow. Okay. So, so I started Wardell, I guess, 22 years ago or something like that. And before that, um, I was a professional musician for a bunch of years. I had a band, played around town and all that kind of stuff. And that was fun. I had, uh, I was a gymnastics coach and ran a couple of gymnastics clubs. Um, I was a entrepreneur in a lot. I, I, I really meandered. Like I ended up, I was one of those guys that went to university and then one day was like, oh, Oh, I, I guess I have a degree. Maybe, maybe I should stop now. Like it was kind of like that. Like I, that course looks interesting and that course looks interesting. And, you know, and so that's what my life is, was like that for a long time. And I think maybe because I was that kind of personality that it all came together eventually into this thing, which is my main business, which is, which is Wardell International. But um, I mean, if you're interested, I can kind of tell you the story of kind of how it started, I guess. Um, so I, I, had been dabbling in business, but also reading lots of business books. And there's one book that really was interesting to me. It was a really simple book, but but it was a, the E Myth, like you know the, the Michael Gerber's E Myth, which is kind of famous. But um, and so so I, I read this book. I thought that's that's interesting. And you know what? I, I would like to meet this author. I'd like to connect with this guy and maybe even work for him. So I I sort of stepped off a cliff, I guess, which I've done many times in my life, and I. Quit my job and I told my wife everything was going to be okay. <laughs> That's an important part of the story. Yeah. And, uh, and 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 I wrote a resume and I sent it down to California to, to Gerber and um, I got back a response that said basically you know don't call us we'll call you, you know, kind, <laughs> of, kind, of, kind of response right. And I thought you know I guess if I look at my resume maybe I would say the same thing. It's sort of eclectic and goes all over the place and. So I thought I need to fix this thing. I decided, I told my wife, I mean, I quit my job, remember? Like I did that before. Like that's sort of my nature a bit. So I, I was almost like, I have to make this work. So I ripped out the cover letter, which I thought, okay, fine. And I, and I went and bought some suits that I could not afford from Harry Rosen. And, uh, and I hired a videographer and I wrote a script. And I went to this place in Vancouver. It's called Highcroft Manor, the University Women's Club. My mom happened to be a member there at the time. So I, I got this real nice background. And I gave this talk about why he should hire me. That became the, uh, the cover letter. And I put that, and I, so I filmed this whole thing. And then I thought, okay. And I kind of ripped out my reference let letters, so to speak. And I took a, back in the day, it was a cassette recorder. And I went to everybody that I knew that sounded kind of important in my life. If you're a business owner or a doctor or a lawyer or something, whatever. And I said, why is Mark Wardell more than what he appears to be on paper? And people said all these real nice things about me, which was great for my ego, but it, but it was nice to hear. Um, and then a buddy of mine that worked at a radio station, which today is Jack FM, but it was something different back then. And, and he edited it all together for me and put some background music and had a DJ do an intro and an outro. So I had this Mark Wardell is an entrepreneur, do, 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 music, and then, and then people saying these things. And so that was this cassette and that became uh, my reference letter. And then the rest of my resume, I turned into a full color brochure with pictures of my gymnasts and things like that, just kind of talking through my story. Uh, and then I went out and I found uh, you'll remember, not, not it depends on how old people are, but, but back in the day, you used to buy audio books in these plastic molded, big giant, remember those, those big giant sort of book kind of things? Oh, no. Okay. Remember those? Okay. So I found one that had a space for a, a, a video cassette, because of course the big video cassettes, and the audio cassette, and then a space for my resume. And then I had a photographer take a picture of my front uh, and my picture of my back, which I put my front on the front and my back on the back. And it's had this just for fun because I thought if, if he doesn't have a sense of humor, you know, I don't want to work for him. So I, I, I put this whole package together and I couriered that to California. Uh, I got a phone call back right away from this guy named Jerry, who was his executive assistant. And Jerry basically said, uh, you know, what do you want? <laughs> you <know? laughs> I said, well, uh, I want to meet Gerber for lunch. 
uh, get together with him and, and sort of see where things might go. He said, oh, okay, look, he's busy, flies all over the place, but let's see what we can do. So uh, my, fit, my toe was in the door, but I wasn't all the way, all the way in the door. So I thought, so what am I gonna do now? So I started calling down, so this is a longer story than maybe you expected. So <laughs> but I started calling down the different people that worked there and said, uh, tell me about Gerber. Like, I want to know about this guy. And I discovered he was really into clothing, liked to dress really well, liked monogram shirts, and particularly he liked his ties. I also learned he was a, a, a jazz musician and a jazz fan and a saxophone player. So I went to the mall and I found myself a silk tie with a picture of a saxophone on the front. And I embroidered my name and my phone number in the back of the tie. And I wrote a letter and I couriered that, that to, to him. I got a phone call next day when that landed from Jerry again. And Jerry said, this is what he said in quotes. He said, Mr. Gerber says he gives. That's what he said to me. So he said, what do you want? I said, lunch. Okay, so what does he like? He likes uh, Italian food. Tell me his favorite restaurant. So we found a restaurant in Santa Rosa, California that he liked. I called and made reservations. I went and bought more suits than I could afford even less. Kissed my wife goodbye. Said, I'll be back. Hopped in the car and I drove all the way to Santa Rosa, California. Uh, the border, back then you could, the border was a totally different situation. In fact, the border guard, I, I was honest about what I was doing. The border guard said, good, we, need, we need people like you in the USA. Good for you. Good luck. You know, go ahead. Like you wouldn't never get that now, but that's how it was. So I went down to California, met him for lunch. He said, uh, what do you want? I said, unless you kick me out, I'll see you tomorrow morning for work. He said, okay, let's see what we can do. And I stayed there for about a year and I, and I learned everything I possibly could about his business. He eventually, you know, trained me in, in to be an advisor for, for that company, went through their training program, um, wanted me to come back to Canada to start sort of a Gerber North thing, but I was too entrepreneurial to do that, I guess. So I shook his hand and I said, thank you, but I'm going to do my own thing. It's been sliced. I mean, I wrote their website, I did a lot of work for them while I was there, all free, by the way, I didn't get paid anything when I was there. Um, and then I drove, drove back to Vancouver and started Wardell. Well, well actually, I sort of went to the library uh, and I spent the next four years in the library actually reading every business book that I could find in the library and writing the core of what eventually became Wardell. So there, there is the story of how I started. Wow. Um, I mean, was there, was there other things in your life that you just sort of poured your heart into? I mean, because, you know, right now to create a video, it's really easy, right? You just yeah. pull out your phone and you do it. But yeah. at that time, there was a substantial cost and effort to be able to put something together and edit yeah. it and make it look professional. So, yeah. I mean, was that just the first time where you just poured or, or did you have a history of pouring yourself into anything that you did? Uh, I'm kind of an all or nothing personality I suppose or, or you know like that's sort of who I am um and so everything I've done from coaching I mean, music I mean I mean not to but yeah like like when I I was a self-taught guitar player and songwriter and so I decided I wanted to go to Cap College or which is now Cap University which has a music it was, it was quite a good jazz program at the time I don't know what it's like now I haven't but, but it was a great good jazz program and um, I wanted to go there to learn uh, music. I wasn't the greatest musician, so I went at the time, so I went in and hired uh, a, somebody to teach me. I, I knew that there's going to be all these modes and things and modals and stuff in music. I didn't really understand any of that stuff at the time. So I basically got a crash course in how to pass the test to get into Cap University and trained as aggressively as I could on the guitar to try to get, and I basically somehow I talked my way in and I squeaked in and I, and I, and I got into the, the program and and that's how I ended up starting my band. So I was the only guy there that was really writing songs. And so I pulled together some of the best musicians and we ended up creating a band and playing around town. So um, so it's, you know, good or bad because these kind of, you go off, I mean, I can, there's stories where I've failed miserably too, you know, like, <laughs> you know, like, but so there's good and bad, but it's just how I am. And I, I feel like life is more interesting when you just commit to stuff and go for it, you know? Yeah, this is stuff. This is how it is. And my wife's is similar. Like when I when like when I turned forty and I'm fifty, turning fifty six this year. When I turned forty, my wife, same thing. She sent a letter and a big bouquet of flowers to Maureen Chant, who's who's you know Jimmy Patterson's executive assistant, and and um, told her all about me and the fact that I was turning forty and I was some whatever nice thing she said and convinced her to uh, to get me a meeting with Jimmy. And so my fortieth present for my your present for my wife was you know hanging out with Jimmy Patterson for an hour. He said, sure. And I went to his place and we, we chatted about life and business and leadership and things. And, and so like, that's just, 
I don't know. That's the way we function. Our, our poor kids, right? They have to. They have to. <laughs> that's a great gift. I mean, it's, I guess arguably the one of the greatest entrepreneurs in Canadian history is is a great way to celebrate your fortieth. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah. It was. It was really amazing. Such a nice guy. Such a nice guy. Came out in his purple, you know, jacket and mauve colored shirt and stuff and tie. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Wonderful. Well, I mean, you, you spent all this time in a library four years after yeah. uh, mentoring under, uh, you know, Michael Gerber, yeah. which is, must have been amazing. Yeah. Um, so when you talk to people, what, and, you know, your expertise is management consultant, what do people misunderstand about management consulting or management? Um, you know, I think, I mean, I, I, I don't know if we're a management consulting firm anymore. More, I would almost call us like a business consulting firm sure. in business a way, just, just to be, not that it, it's a subtle difference maybe, but, um, you know, I think business owners, especially entrepreneurs, like they're starting a business, there's a, there's a strong tendency to be a, a micromanager. Um, it's, it's built in to the personality often that's attracted to starting a business because you're you do have to step off a cliff to some degree to start. A bit. I mean, everybody, but my story might sound, there's some craziness to it, but everybody has a story that's got some aspect of that to it, right? You know, some are greater cliffs and smaller cliffs, but it's the same kind of concept, right? And so that personality is attracted to running and building businesses. Um, that, that personality also uh, believes they can do everything. Uh, often they can't. I, I, some, I, I, I believe God makes entrepreneurs just slightly dumb because otherwise <laughs> that way, that way we'll try stuff that we, it's going to take it be way. Hard. I never knew it was going to be four years in the library when I started writing my books and, and reading and researching, you know, I thought it was going to be done in a year kind of thing. Right. So, so I think you need to, um, uh, you know, so entrepreneurs have this tendency to, to micromanage as a result of that. Like they, they do everything themselves. They have the vision of themselves and they capture everything themselves. But there's a limitation to what you're able to accomplish when you have that mindset. And it's a necessary mindset to launch, like to get off the ground. It's not a bad thing, but it becomes a self-limiting um, uh, attribute as the business starts to, as you have some success and the business starts to grow. Uh, you know, and so that, that's really why I started Wardell is to, is to help business owners overcome that challenge. You have to move past that because you cannot scale a business by yourself. There's some, maybe technology, there's some ways you can leverage, but still, you still have to leverage technology. You have to leverage something beyond yourself because you've got limited hours. You can be smarter than me, work harder than me, you know, work longer hours than me, all that stuff. No problem. I'll still beat you if you stay solo. You know, if you stay independent, if I build a team uh, of both people and technology and, and methodology around me that is that helps me to capture whatever it is that I'm trying to achieve with the group of people rather than independently. So I think that's one of the biggest, um, you know, things. And, and entrepreneurs with their personality sometimes can be strong personalities too. some of them because of that. And again, it's, it's not a bad thing. Um, it's a good thing, but those strong personalities can make it hard for people sometimes to listen to mass management consultants or, or business consultants because they think they know the way, which is why we actually have the most success with business owners that have bumped their head a few times. Like usually like startups are not always, our, I mean, we can help startups, absolutely. Um, and we love to, but we get more success and more companies coming to us that have been in business for a number of years and have had challenges, have tripped a bit scuff their knees, so to speak, and are saying, okay, maybe there's some other things I need to put in place that are, maybe there's a different framework or different pattern. Maybe there's something I need to think of or learn. And then suddenly they're open and their minds are open. And then we can work really well with those kinds of people. Yeah. So you're talking, I guess, phase one is some form of delegation. And I guess phase two is some sort of decentralization of leadership. Right. So, well, we, so that's exactly, so we, I call this thing the value of pyramid. Actually, you're, you're, I don't know if you're probably not meaning to, you're describing actually the process that we take people through quite, quite well. So the value pyramid is a four level pyramid. It's kind of the philosophy or the framework that Wardell is connected to or, or is built on. Um, and uh, at the, the four levels are an owner driven business, and then a people driven business, as you're saying, and then a systems driven business. And then a culture-driven business. And as a business climbs the value pyramid, you can, you can grow a business in terms of sales and still be an owner-driven business. But if you do so, your risk grows accordingly because if anything happens to you, the business will, will collapse and disappear. So 
Um, so, so, you know, as a business grows and people start to realize that they need to put some structure in place, the business becomes more scalable, healthier, stronger. You move up to a people-driven business. That's, that's, you've hired some great employees. They bring some passion, some ideas, some creativity. Hopefully, you've got, hopefully you've done a good job of finding those people. And, and that's awesome. Unless, of course, one of those people leave, in which case it falls back on your shoulders, right? So, so the next step in evolution, as you're, as you're talking about, is we call it a systems-driven business. It's driven by the systems. And when I say systems, I don't just mean policies and procedures, although that's obviously center to it. I mean, also the key performance indicators that measuring progress. I mean, the position outlines and job descriptions that, that are connected to people. I even mean the strategic plan that might, might be in place to, to point this thing in a certain direction. So the, so the guts. The, the, the structure that's necessary. And, and just at that level, you're probably, you know, top 10% if you get to a position like that. But the, the businesses that we, that we really love, I, honestly, any, any business you could, you could name that you are impressed by, I think, uh, is probably so because they've gone to the next level, the top level, which is what I call a culture-driven business. And culture-driven doesn't just mean it's got a great culture, although that's Part of it. it's necessary to have a great culture in order to be culture driven but but it's an aspect of the culture because the culture at kpmg is clearly different from the culture at red bull well in england where they have a slide that goes between the two floors there's no slide between the two floors at kpmg although wouldn't it be awesome if your accountant did come sliding down the slide to, to meet you <laughs> that would be cool <laughs> but it's not likely to happen in the near future at kpmg but 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 both cultures are good like like it's just they're different so you know, the key to sort of making that final leap uh, is this aspect of continuous improvement, right? In other words, it's having great people and great systems and then an environment where people contribute new ideas and those new ideas get the best of those ideas get captured by the system so that they can continue to live even if people go. And that creates a positive continuous improvement of spiral up that makes a business grow rapidly. And any really tremendous business that you can think of has that kind of an operation it's something functioning, you know, like that. Yeah. Give me some examples of, I guess, um, ways that it happens. Maybe some of the structural elements that make that happen or design elements for an organization. Uh, okay, sure. So, um, well, okay, so the, the, the way we go through the process, uh, and it doesn't have to go this way exactly because, you know, entrepreneurs are always pulling us off in different directions, but there, <laughs> but there is, because that's the nature of that personality right they all have ADD they all talk fast like me uh you know and you know it, it, so, so but anyway um don't worry I say lots of things I bring a loop around back eventually <laughs> uh um we go from leadership to management to marketing to finance to operations to sales so there's there's a flow to the the, the way and, and these things build on each other if you're able to do it properly they build on each other in a kind of a uh to some degree, a linear fashion, or it's not exactly linear, but they, they build on top of each other to build that structure. So, so with the leadership element, you know, we want to start by saying, where is this company going? What are the directions? What's the strategy? What's the mission, the vision, the values? What's the foundation that this business sits on? Um, very important to motivate everybody that's connected to the business, right? Including the owner, quite frankly, which sometimes when they show up with us, if they've been beaten up a little bit, they've actually forgotten the passion you know, um, I like Peter Senge and so five discipline stuff. Like I, I think that stuff's important. Like to, to be passionate about what you do is really, really critical. Um, but then you need, obviously on top of that passion, you need a very tightly structured system that has some logic tied to it. So, so we help them to build some of that stuff out. And then, and then from there, we start to um, build the framework. And this is how you get people to start working together and trying to make movement. So you start with organizational structure, right? Who reports to whom and why? And it's not about reporting really, it's about accountability. So, you know, uh, and so who is accountable for what in this organization and how, how does that work? And then how do we build the, the KPIs and so forth and systems that it's much like um, uh, build, a building actually. Like, like if you put the foundation in the ground, uh, that would be your mission, vision, values, strategic plan kind of stuff. And then if you put like a, the, the walls up, you know, the framework, that would be your, your, your org structure. And then you attach walls and windows, electrical and so forth as you, as you build and roof it roofs, <laughs> right? All, the, all these, these components that you're adding to this building, that's the, that's the KPIs and the methodology and all this, all this other nuts and bolts that, that go on there. Um, the other piece that's really super important, which ties back to strategy, is the, uh, is the marketing angle, of course, because you have to know who you're selling to, 
why you're selling to those people. And those are really, really critical questions that have to be answered. And once you've kind of got that package wrapped up, you're starting to get a really solid business. We know who we're selling to, why we're selling to them. We've got a structure that's, that's running this process, right? And then we can drill down departmentally to, to fix these things, operations. We can, we can drill down in, in, into specifically the sales processes that are gonna, that are gonna, that are gonna operate the, the marketing machine that you've built and so forth. So it's, it's um, yeah, very much like Lego. We're like building a building as you kind of go through. And as, the more you do that, um, the more people that are part of that organization uh, buy in to, to that process. But very often we start with an organization and people are not that bought in actually at first. I mean, the owner certainly loves this idea, but employees can be a little bit uh, scared of it sometimes or because they don't understand, they don't know what's coming, you know, and change is always uh, scary for people. Um, and also if you're shining a big spotlight on there, you're saying, hey, you've got this job. Uh, I wanna, we're gonna document your job in a way that's so structured and systemized, almost anybody could do it. That could feel like, you know, like, uh, you know, job security is, is now uh, at risk, but it's entirely opposite because we're, when we put systems in structure, uh, we're actually humanizing a business, not dehumanizing, we're humanizing because we're giving those individuals an opportunity to, to just, the mechanics are there. Now you're thinking, how can I make this thing better? So. Yeah, so you're talking about the structure, which sounds like the systems phase. Now, there's a little bit of accountability. Let's focus on the hierarchy. Now, how do you get those informal leaders to come out? How do you get the ideas flowing in that environment? Uh, well, that, you know, so again, like I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to default back to systems quite a bit, but, um, but it's a meeting the meeting structure and the way you capture ideas in your meetings is really, really important. I mean, I, I, I'm a big, I think, I know you're also a big fan of the, of the daily huddle. I'm a big fan. We do every morning, 8.30, Wardell, daily huddle. We do it, we do it online now, right now, but, but, um, how long you know, is your huddles? Uh, 15 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, is it, and it's everyone, I guess. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So yeah, so we, 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 we do the daily huddle. We do our, our regular monthly meetings with all the advisors. We have, I do, we do one-on-ones. And so the, within these structure, these systems, the, these meeting structures, um, which should all have standard agendas, of, uh, uh, always, uh, you know, within those standard agendas should be opportunities for uh, ideas and continuous improvement so that people can, can contribute, right? So, and an agenda item should be what systems are failing right now or what new ideas could we have to improve and and as a leader you have to really support these ideas and you have to really acknowledge these ideas. not every idea is going to work and going to end up being an actual change in the organization but if you if people feel ignored they will stop contributing to those ideas <laughs> For obviously, why why would anybody if, if if you feel like you're not being listened to? So it's super important that you acknowledge people and that you get back to people and that you you know and that you praise publicly and you really do that sort of thing a lot. Um, and then there's lots of little fun things you can do you know to to promote this stuff. Like um, you know we had we had one client when they they'd been through a strategic planning session and they wanted to promote their uh, their you know, everybody kind of done, done the hard, hard work of figuring out their mission, their vision, their values, and, and sort of a basic plan. So they had a meeting and everybody was in the room and, and um, but the, the CEO was not there and people were waiting and waiting and waiting. And you have to, this is a certain personality, this, this owner, you know, and all of a sudden he was, the whole time he was hiding in the closet. And, and then he suddenly burst out of the closet and they had music blaring and they had signs dropped in the ceiling, confetti and stuff. And like, it was like, like, so, you know, and I've had other clients that have, um, you know, they make little uh, little cards uh, where their mission, vision, values, and things are on these cards, and everybody in the company carries them around. With hard plastic cards, kind of thing. I don't know if that's environmentally friendly. Maybe there's a maybe there's a, <laughs> a better way to do that. But but um, you know, all kinds of little, little or, or cakes. You know, you put put them on cake, like all kinds of things. You know, internal campaigns are a really great way to promote any aspect of the development of your culture or any direction you're trying to point your company. You know, because people like that stuff and they buy into that stuff. Work should be fun. Like, I mean, we all work hard together. Work should be fun. And and internal campaigns of any sort. Um, I've had where the whole management team has done a, a steak, steak uh, lunch for all the staff. You know, when they hit certain numbers, everybody can, you know, you know, make the mistake and then send everybody home for the for half day paid or whatever. Like, you know, all kinds of fun stuff like that can really drive a continuous improvement culture because people love it. They buy in. But notice in all those examples, 
they are tied to the intended outcome, right? Like, like, like the, the steak dinner was a result of hitting targets company-wide, that sort of thing. So it, it, it's fun tied specifically to the objectives that you're trying to achieve as an organization. So. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah, I think that that, that uh, connection is the important thing you mentioned because I, I know that the, I've seen a lot of things where I wasn't quite sure what the connection was between the fun and you know the organizational objectives. Yeah, yeah, and 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 but that's why you have to do the work, the hard work up front of understanding what your objectives are in the first place. It's not just I mean, work should be a great place to go. You should enjoy it, but you are trying to accomplish something together. I mean, you are being paid to do something, and and and. And it's a two way. I mean, working for a company is, is, is trade. I'm trading you my time and energy and the value of who I am. You're, in, you're trading some money. So a fair value exchange is what should be there. But if you want somebody to bring passion to that, you have to give them a reason to bring passion to that. You know, you cannot motivate. In fact, you can't motivate your employees even if you want to. Like, like it's, a, it's, a, it's a fallacy to think you can motivate your employees. You have to, you can, because motivation is internal, right? You can, you motivate yourself. You don't motivate other. I mean, you can motivate them a little. I mean, you can a carrot and a stick, you know, raises and that you can do things to motivate people, but it's always short lived uh, if the motivation isn't internal. But you can inspire people, right? You can inspire them with a compelling story, a vision of the future, and that will cause them to motivate themselves. And you know, it's why I like um, like uh, my buddy is Brian Scudamore over there at, at One Hundred Got Junk. Mm -hmm. You know, he he likes to. He says he wants to hire, and I agree, you want to hire motivated people rather than try to motivate people. And I think it's a good way to look at it. Yeah, very good. Very cool. Now, um, I know you have a lot of ideas. You involve a lot of different things. Is there anything that you want to bring up that, or a question that I haven't asked you? Um, I'm not sure. I think, I think uh, being an entrepreneur is hard like it's harder than many people realize um and i so i think having maybe this is one idea maybe having having a good network around you we talked about it a little bit at the beginning but having a good network around you is super important having people that you can trust to give you honest feedback because it's hard to get especially in the early days sometimes it's hard to get that real genuine honest feedback so work to build that network of people that will be honest with you and people that that are uh, going to be positive with you and help support you in your growth just as you will support them in their growth and work together to be more successful i have some little brain trusts that i'm part of that i've found really really beneficial i i some little little networking groups that i'm that i have they're not um formal networking groups that others that I've necessarily paid others to join, although I have done that sort of thing before. I've been involved in tech and so forth. But, but uh, what's really helped me tremendously is these groups of small people. I got one in particular that I that every quarter I have lunch with these two other guys, and uh, they're both quite uh, senior in in their, their organizations that they're part of, and they're honest with me and they give me genuine feedback and we help each other and 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 it's that kind of thing has been. Uh, tremendous. It's also one of the, I mean, one of the reasons that I built Wardell, because I know that having, uh, like our whole team of advisors are all senior business folks. They've all C-suite folks or business owners or whatever. And then they get trained in the Wardell methodology, which is really like a, like a, uh, a practical MBA program, really. They get trained in how to deliver that work. And then they work directly with all these clients. And so whether it's Wardell or whatever, but these kind of relationships I've found to be central for the growth that I've had with my company, you know, uh, yeah, even even the reason that we're international is because of my network, not because of anything else. It's not even not even a need to be international. We really the plenty of work for a company like Wardell in probably even in just Vancouver, but having clients around the world uh, creates a different flavor to what we do. And it's very interesting. And we have different cultures that we get to learn about. And I get to discover that entrepreneurs are uh, similar, like no matter what part where in the world they are there's a very similar there's a, there's a uh, and there's a great bond right which is why if you want to build the network of other successful entrepreneurs you'll find quite often that they're quite in my experience quite willing to to be helpful to give another person a hand up you know entrepreneurs aren't the type necessarily to to give a hand out so much 
you know, a, a little bit, but they definitely want to give a hand up. That's the personality of these individuals. And, and what's better than that anyway? So.